everyone, welcome to Audiobookish. This is an audiobook review and discussion podcast. My name is Fahed Ram and I'm joined by Poppy Knight. Hello. And today we are going to be reviewing a podcast called Spirit Box Radio. It's an immersive horror audio drama. Atmospheric and engaging Spirit Box Radio is an audio drama which will lull you into a false sense of security before pulling the rug from under your feet. If you love the creeping sense of unease of the Magnus archives, the weird whimsy of Welcome to the Night Vale, and the LGBTQ plus representation from Hello from the Hello Woods, you will love Spirit Box Radio. Spirit Box Radio is the winner of the podcast Best Fiction Podcast Awards 2021 and a finalist in the 2021 Audioverse Awards. It's about Sam Hemfield, who is the unlikely host of Spirit Box Radio, a show for witches, arcanists, and the magically inclined. Sam took over the show after the mysterious disappearance of his mother, the illustrious Madame Marie, a renowned psychic. No penchant for the arcane arts, Sam struggles to find his feet. As he does, he discovers that Spirit Box Radio may be haunted by something much worse than ghosts. Secrets. It releases, well, we're reviewing season one, but um, it says on their website they release every Thursday at three o'clock UK time. And their tagline is tune in, get spooky. Do you want to uh, talk about Spirit Box Radio and the author Pippin Era Major? Yes. So Spirit Box Radio was created by Pippin Era Major, writer, etc. Pippin was born in North Wales and grew up surrounded by sheep and other small mammals. With a shortage of decent human company, he started writing stories. Now an adult, Pippin writes mostly literary fiction, occasionally dabbling in the fantastical and the weird. Pippin is currently looking for representation for two literary novels. Hanging Sloth Studios? Hanging Sloth Studios is a Manchester-based podcasting studio. At the moment, the studio is run primarily by Pippin Era Major, creative lead and sloth-in-chief, with two other founding members, Alex P. Liber Richardson and Jessica Jeffrey, as voice actors. Okay, so I came across this podcast because I was on a podcasting course that was kind of bringing a whole bunch of us podcasters together to kind of provide us with guidance on how to grow our podcast and production and all that sort of stuff. And Pippin's podcast was one of the podcasts selected on there. So it's not something that I came across naturally. It was kind of a podcast I was exposed to by networking. And the premise of it just sounded really interesting. I thought it was a good fit mm. for what we review here as well. We've kind of, we have kind of strayed off audiobooks occasionally. <laughs> so I think this is the second non-audiobook we, that we've done. Mm. That's yeah. correct, isn't it? So um, what were your kind of initial impressions of it? Yeah, no, I really loved it. I mean, my first initial impression is the fact that it's so suited to being this audio format because it's about radio. It's like simulating a radio show as well as telling a story. And I, I, as is a common theme on these reviews, I love things that are meta. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, so that really stood out to me. And I mean, I've since learned listening to some uh, kind of bonus content on there that Pippin did kind of toy with the idea of making this a novel or whatever before settling on the podcast form. And yeah, the fact that this is a podcast that makes it seem like you are listening to a segment on Spirit Box Radio, the mystical thing that that is, is just so cool. So that was the first thing that stood out to me and something that I loved about it the whole way through. So yeah, my overall impressions are that it's fantastic and thank you very much for introducing me to it. I absolutely devoured it. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, um, same here really. I mean, the first thing I'd, I'd like to say, I don't know... Like from the sounds of, you know, when I was hearing Pippin talking about their production podcast, most of the people that were producing podcasts on the course were, this is like a side hustle that they're doing outside their everyday mm. jobs. And I just want to say, like, just off the top of my head, like the production values here are mm. absolutely yeah, yeah, superb, yeah. very, very professional. This would not be out of place on something like um, BBC Sounds or mm. Audible, you know, kind of one of the big Audible podcasts that they produce are, like the sound design and yeah, kind stunning. of mm. is, is absolutely stunning. There are a couple of technical nitpicky things that I can, <laughs> I'll talk about a little bit later on, but just overall, like the sound design and yeah. the, the quality of the performances. So it's basically mm -hmm. a full cast performance. I think we've got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, over 10 like, performers and all of them kind of hit it out of the park yeah. um, in, in the voices that they do so um 
yeah, so that that's kind of like my initial impressions of it. So it's really difficult to talk about like this in any great detail. We're going to try and avoid spoilers wherever we can, but just uh, mm-hmm. you know, you know, spoiler klaxon, spoiler klaxon, spoiler klaxon. There may be season one spoilers involved in our discussion of this because it's really difficult to get to the meat of the story without uh, spoiling some elements um, of it. Okay, so we kind of start off in the first couple of episodes where Sam has. Uh, taken over this radio show after the disappearance of uh, Madame Marie. And I really like the kind of central conceit of him reading out these weird letters from mm. like the faithful listeners and that kind of, it acts as, you know, that, that meta thing that you love where kind of that mm-hmm. the story references something that's not happening within the larger story, which I really enjoyed as well. Yeah, no, I agree. I even have a little note here that it's sort of in some ways those parts of it feel like a series of short stories. Yes. And so obviously just really clever for Pippin to have written those short stories just in themselves, short story writing, you know. But also, like you say, the fact that there's some threads between them that are really cool. But yeah, I think if you're a fan of short stories, you can really appreciate that in this you know kind of short story collections if that's the kind of thing you read and listen to then yeah that's really cool and little sort of mini horror stories basically but as well there are little clues in there as to what the overall story is what the deal is with sam what the deal is with madame marie uh that's just really really clever yeah yeah and kind of it initially what i liked about kind of initially is kind of it's, it's not entirely clear whether like the supernatural elements are real or if they're imagined or if it's something in between um, and that that picture could become slightly clearer as the story progresses as well hmm. that's fair I think I'd always taken it as seeing them as true but there is a big part in it how one of the characters is skeptical of yes. um, all that kind of stuff so it is definitely a a part in it as to yeah, yeah. I mean, what's really going on there and stuff? Th- yeah. There's that, and Sam is like always appear to me as kind of as a somewhat unreliable narrator. Yes, as I have well. that note down as well. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's kind of the other thing because a lot of it's spoken, like just from Sam's not Sam's point of view, but Sam narrates a lot of the stories mm-hmm. himself. So yeah, it's kind of until the other characters came in, I wasn't entirely sure whether it's just like the rantings of someone who's suffering from some sort of delusion or oh, not right, okay. yeah so that's kind of the, the other thing that I kind of had in the back of my head as well yeah I find it really interesting with that because yeah so Sam's hosting the show and as part of the show reads letters from the faithful listeners and very much Pippin with some great voice acting does go into not pretending that he's being the voice of the person writing it but very much adjusts the tone in the performance to suit as if it could be that person you know goes really dark and serious when it is dark and serious and kind of puts emphasis where the writer of the letter would as opposed to a stranger reading it kind of thing which I I think is really good but then equally one of my favorite things about it and this is more so early on but does happen throughout is I love how it's like creepy letter yeah there's all this scary stuff yeah well, guys, wasn't that interesting? <laughs> yes, I, I, yeah, I yeah, love it so yeah, much. And that yeah. very much ties in with what you say about the unreliable narrator part, because a lot of stuff is very obvious to us as the listeners that Sam certainly early on doesn't see. And it, it's really clever that kind of you have to read between the lines. Um, so, yeah, I'm not saying it's really obvious to us as a as a bad thing, but I'm meaning that it's not explicitly acknowledged by Sam but you can infer it from things where maybe he's missed that uh, which I thought was really clever it makes it really fun to listen to as well when you have that kind of engaging thing and then it's also interesting following Sam's journey to discovering some of those things that kind of maybe we were suspecting further along and also pointing out to us more clues that we missed as well yeah and I think one of the things I want to pick up that you mentioned there is kind of how masterfully this shifts tone mm. from serious mm. and scary to light-hearted and funny mm. to yeah. whimsical to treacherous and from kind of like earnest like there's like an earnestness that kind of that mm. Sam is a very earnest 
character kind of almost naive in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. and that kind of just runs all the way through kind of I was like doing some fan casting in my head like if this was a movie he would play each character and um like for me like Sam would be played by like not um not the actor but the the character Andy Dwyer from Parks and Recs is kind of he's got that same sort of like exuberant energy of like uh, mm. going into stuff maybe not the sharpest tool in in the box <laughs> even is kind of like there I know kind of like um he's had uh you know the characters has kind of like suffered trauma that might have affected his like emotional development a little bit um but still he was he did kind of make a few decisions that I thought well come on dude be a little yeah. bit more intelligent I mean but that's also the horror genre as well uh, mm. kind of like you know maybe not making the most intelligent decisions <laughs> about things. That is very fair, yeah. And I think, so horror is not a huge genre that I'm massively into. I definitely don't dislike it, but I often don't seek it out. Yeah. But I think this is really good. It's sort of, I can see this as sort of gateway horror kind of thing. And I mean that in absolutely no disrespect to it, but partly because of this balance of humour. Even if you're not a horror fan even if you really dislike horror, I could still see that you could enjoy this because it has some really creepy, sinister stuff, but it also has some really funny stuff and it also has such a driving story through it that I believe that could probably take you through some of the maybe creepier parts of it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I thought. About. It, it's funny you say that. Kind of, it, it, I see it like an odd parallel between this and the Netflix series Midnight Mass. Okay. Have you seen that? So it's, I haven't, no. No, it's really, really good. So it, ostensibly it's Midnight Mass is a vampire story, but it's not really a vampire story, if that makes sense. It's more about how you know, very much like this story. It's more, very much more about kind of like how just different generations of the same family uh, interact mm, with each yeah. other and how um, families deal with secrets and trauma Mm. and how kind of like the wider community also handles that and it also explores themes of religion and tradition and being an outsider which I think are also themes that are very much explored in this as well so I think we we haven't really talked about the characters a lot do you want to kind of explain a little bit about um aside from um Samuel there's a a whole kind of family involved as well yeah so Sam's sister Kitty uh, is Kitty the investigator and has also worked with Madame Marie on the kind of arcane stuff and goes investigating arcane things and Kitty's I don't really know how to describe Kitty's personality um Oh, she's very much kind of like, um, she's very much like a, a go-getter. She'll just rush headfirst into things without, you know, considering. Uh, seem- I found her a little bit like sarcastic as well okay. at times. So, yeah, so she's got like, she's a very like forceful personality, mm. I found. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I really like Kitty, but I find it hard to put into words what what she's about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then you've also got Anna is another sibling, but as I referenced before, kind of doesn't believe in a lot of what Madame Marie did and, um, you know, kind of arcane stuff. Um, Maybe has to have that challenged a little bit uh, throughout. Is really protective of Sam. Like overly so. Yes. Yes. And yeah, a lot of it is her kind of fighting between the two worlds, kind of the new life that she's built for herself and also the one with her family and all the stuff that comes with that. As you say, kind of the the past and the traumas involved in that and this whole spirit box radio world, which, she, yeah, she distances herself from where Kitty is very involved and where Sam is or has been up until this point stuck between really wanting to be involved with all that stuff the opposite to Anna, but not being allowed to, um, which is explored later on. So, yeah. And um, one thing I maybe should have mentioned when I was talking about the meta stuff as well is that I really loved how this throws you in with the world already created in that Spirit Box Radio has been going on for ages. This segment has been going on for ages and you as the listener are tuning in to hear Madame Marie 
but she's gone and we don't know why. And I thought that was really clever and extremely well done. You weren't sat there thinking, but wait, what the hell happened just then? And you also weren't feeling too overly explained to of, okay, this is the backstory. This is how it happened. This is what you need to know. It's so organic, um, yeah. which and is really good. It's really difficult kind of building that sort of like... Um, the world building is really well executed mm. in this. You've got you've got a really firm idea of the time and the place and the culture and the type of characters that inhabit this world mm-hmm. where it's not like our planet, kind of. I think in the world of um, Spirit Box Radio, I think the impression, that at least I got, maybe I got the wrong impression, is that magic is something that's a little bit more accepted or maybe, yeah, I don't know, what, what, do, what do you think about that? Do you think it's... <laughs> It is a really hard one, isn't it? Because there's sort of talks about, yeah, lots of people not believing and very much the arcanists and the people who tune into Spirit Box Radio and stuff like that are in some senses kind of part of a group of people that's a smaller group in society that is actually believing of this stuff. And so I can therefore see how it could happen in our world. You know, it could be set to be this is actually going on. Yeah. Um, but also I can see a sense of it being a different place. And yeah, yeah there's some idea of being more open. I guess because I'm not in any circles of, you know, really delving into, you know, this kind of thing. Yes, yeah. Um, I don't know if it feels like it fits within that or if it feels like it is putting itself as something separate. Yeah, I think that's a fair point, actually. I think it's definitely... It's definitely open interp- to interpretation, which is another thing I think is really good about the, the podcast, oh, yeah. is that mm-hmm. kind of like there's lots of different ways that you can kind of interpret characters um, mm. and this and that. I mean, like there was one character that I immediately took against, and that was mm. Oliver the Florist. I, right. just thought, I just thought I just immediately, as soon as he opened his mouth, oh, he's a wrong one. He's a wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we won't go into whether he's a wrong one or not, but yeah, he, he definitely kind of has his um, has his moments there. It's um, so interesting because well. a lot of people uh, with me seeing kind of reactions to it and stuff, a lot of people love Oliver yeah, and love the dynamic there. And I'm sort of closer to your end of it yeah. in that it makes me a bit uneasy. I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm as fully on board as everyone else is. And like you say, it is... I guess with everything yeah. that people will have different responses to it but yeah this is, is definitely a, a kind of thing where it is open for you to make your own yeah. judgments on characters and you know like saying how I kind of felt quite drawn to Kitty but others yeah. people might not and various things like that and some people might find Sam's bubbly naivety certainly in the first you know section of it really endearing and some people might find it annoying. Yeah, you, might you know, find it, it, grating, yeah. it is possible for that. And I think, yeah, I think that's basically testament to how well the characters are created, because a two D character is very easy to have everyone agree on what they're like, whereas a fully formed three D person of a character, you're gonna get different people thinking different things. So I think that's a real advantage to it. Yeah, I, I I would agree with that. I mean, the one for, so Sam has got like a, a bit of a crush on Oliver, and I always like and it just immediately occurred to me that there was kind of like going to be a big age difference between the two, and I always mm. find that quite gross. I think and, that's maybe partly why I am also yeah un- and, unsure. Mm-hmm. Yes, and yeah, so I yeah, so that it just made me feel a little bit. Um, um, un- uncomfortable about that um so i think that's probably and you know just kind of the way he talks and stuff like that kind of uh <laughs> i found a little yeah. bit grating too um so yeah so um you kind of mentioned the that you know the two sisters and sam and madame marie is this massive cloud shadow hanging over the family she is like this <laughs> dominating force that would push them in kind of like different uh directions um, she doesn't doesn't sound like uh, Madame Marie was a particularly good parent, but you know her disappearance has caused this major void in the family, and mm-hmm. it does seem like the family dynamics were slightly dysfunctional even before the disappearance. But yes, yeah, just I just found the entire story about how different members of the family pulled together and pulled apart yeah. and came back together, and then you know were, were were pulled in all sorts of different directions. Really interesting. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, what other kind of like topics and notes have you got written down? Yeah, sure. So one thing, a bit while we've been talking about voices and stuff like that, a kind of a small point, but I really felt like Sam reminded me a lot of um, Rachel Paris. Are you oh, familiar? yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now I say it, do you hear it? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, I think if you... So the main way that I know Rachel Paris is from the MASH report, which is fantastic. And she does these very much like delivers topics in an overly sarcastic way, as in delivers them as if they're sincere and they're yeah. obviously not um, parodied ways and has a very distinctive voice in how she does that. And it's always really chirpy and cheery, even when it's really dark. And I guess it kind of links back to that thing of, you know, the dark spooky letters and then, well, wasn't that fun? Kind of, I think those, those are the times when it really pulled through to me. But just as a, a small note, I think if you really enjoy Rachel Paris and her segments on MASH Report, then certainly the beginning sections of this podcast you'll be a fan of because it, it it had so many just yeah links with that I couldn't I couldn't get it out of my head yeah, in, a, in yeah. a really really good way it's really it is great that you've pointed that out because I was trying to think what does this remind me of and yeah you've hit <laughs> yeah. exactly the nail the nail on the head so yeah that's kind of exactly exactly mm-hmm. correct so yeah so I, I, I'd agree with that and cool. it's actually probably worth talking about kind of all the siblings are they've got different voices so um Kitty, well, how would you describe Kitty's accent? I don't know for sure, but yes, again, a distinctive voice, which is very helpful yeah. for audio. Yeah. We have spoken about this before, I think, that being able to tell the characters apart with distinctive voices yeah. is extremely important, yeah. and you definitely can. You know, you know which sister's talking to Sam because of their voices, I and mean, especially on this, you've got like people call in to yeah. the radio um and you can tell who it is from that certainly especially when it's kitty or anna and yeah even without people having to introduce themselves it's really clear so a i think that's really good in that sort of technical sense but also yeah really nice voices to listen to but i i don't know for sure about yeah. accents. but i mean there's kind of a big difference between sam kitty and anastasia's voice because mm-hmm. anastasia's got very much a posh professional lawyerly lawyerly <laughs> voice and which I think is kind of like a byproduct of the the career that she's chosen mm-hmm. chosen to follow and I just found that as you that are a, able to say yeah um. <laughs> yeah um, I think that uh, and I've also thought that kind of created an interesting dynamic between when the, the siblings were having conversations mm. with each other as well so yeah yeah no definitely okay I just want to really quickly mention I think who's who, who's basically my favourite character, which was the Bog Witch. <laughs> I absolutely kind of like love this, you know, this, she, I, I don't even, she sounded like a, a, a creature that just had absolutely no patience <laughs> for you know, any yeah. human beings. It's kind of, she was like fed up with humanity. Well, mm-hmm. most of the other like arcanists were complete idiots. And, you know, mm. the only thing she had time for was really the mud. Yeah. Which I thought was absolutely both hilarious mm-hmm. and uh, entertaining. Oh yeah, no, definitely, definitely a a really big character, even though it's a a relatively minor part in terms of plot, yeah, um, and maybe kind of time, but yeah, a a really character that really sticks with you, and really interesting character, um, and again, amazing voice. There's some more on the bonus content where you can hear the voice actor switching from kind of their regular voice into their right idea. <laughs> voice <laughs> which is really quite funny so yeah yeah, yeah and it really a... gives you a picture of the person i think yeah i think it, it really does and again i think as you mentioned it if this was like a tv show or something like this you'd have to have like a visual representation of that character and i think it just works a lot better when you don't know what mm. what some of these people look like because you can just use like the, the you know the, the theater of the mind um, yeah. as it was to, to, to create your own oh definitely uh, and like possibly for making the horror work yes. well as well, because I I feel that with visual horror, you often either it looks naff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've, there's been a few horror films that I've watched that are just, it's not convincing enough to be scary. It's yeah. just laughable. And or potentially in other ways, you might really put off a section of the 
it would become viewership that I was talking about before that maybe isn't massive horror fans yeah. but love everything else about the story if the visuals were so effective that it was really scary you know so I think that's another reason why the audio works really well for that letting your mind fill in those gaps yeah. but as you said before the use of sound design is absolutely incredible for building atmosphere the kind of music and stuff that's used in the backgrounds is really good for the music is timing great, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the timing of just various sound effects, you know, things breaking, the cats meowing and things like that. Um, oh, we didn't haven't talked about the cats yet, have we? Oh, we, we will, <laughs> we will. Um, and also, like we talked about with our audiobook of the year, uh, True Crime Story, yeah. the effects on voices, for example, if they're calling into the radio, the fact that they sometimes sound a bit staticky as if they're on, you know, a cheap phone calling in through loads of different systems before they're being played out loud onto the radio thing. You know what I mean? That's really, really clever, really well done and, yeah, properly builds that experience and, yeah, the, the images in your mind. Yeah, um, I think it probably... Uh, I probably should talk a little bit about like some of the criticisms I've got for the... Um, okay, yeah. audio design so I think occasionally when it was like the phone calls coming in and it was Sam just presenting the radio show I found it it, it was fine it's just when the characters um, Sam Kitty and Anastasia when they're in the same room together it didn't really sound like they're in the same room together you could okay. kind of tell kind of like they were maybe using different mics or different studio setups I could kind of like tell like it it just didn't feel like they were all in the same place mm in some of those scenes and I, I could also kind of notice odd little bits of like um I don't know what's the right not distortion but kind of you, you could tell kind of like some of the voices have been remastered a little bit too right. much as, as well um but that was kind of like very very rare throughout mm -hmm. it but apart from that I think I felt like technically it was it was really 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 good it was just kind of like those, those few few scenes where all the characters were supposed to be in the same place and I'm, I never really bought that yeah. right okay yeah and i think it is definitely something where we are aware that this is a podcast project yeah that has been you know independently made and um made during lockdown i think as well so well, yeah exactly yeah. that's what i was going to go on to you know the kind of the fact that they are having to record remotely you know a lot of the cast not having met each other and stuff like that it's certainly all those things that you said are very much forgivable and I think it depends on how, I guess, in some ways, how experienced with audio you are. And, you know, if you also do audio production in the sense yeah. of, you know, making a podcast or working in it or whatever, um, that you might pick up on that. And I think, yeah, anything that you do notice is fully forgivable. And a lot of stuff you probably wouldn't even yeah. notice. And I think all made up for by the performances that are underneath that quality yeah. and all those intentional sound changes, like the, you know, effects and the music and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. It's just kind of like me being ultra nitpicky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, That's what we do on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. So, I mean, like I was on the um, Terry Pratchett one. So Yeah, it's... I mean, just <laughs> ultra, um, ultra nitpicky. So I think we've kind of talked, we haven't really done that many spoilers. We haven't kind of really got into the plot, but um, I would say mm. overall... It starts off as like an investigative story, kind of like uh, Sam trying to figure out what's happened to his mother. And then mm -hmm. slowly the, the, the horror elements start revealing themselves in the, 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 the mystical. So it does become a lot more horror-ish towards the mm -hmm. end yeah. of, of the series than it is kind of at the beginning. But, you know, as we, I think, both mentioned at the start, it, there is that kind of like, it does go, it masterfully is able to change its tone from being yeah. light-hearted, building in humorous elements, romantic elements, family tension mm -hmm. elements, seamlessly. And that yeah. is, like, that's, like, as someone who writes stories and has watched, like, a, and listened to a lot of media, that's such a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, really is. So kind of, like, really hats off to, like, the production team for kind of, like, making that happen. I don't know if there's anything else, like, you want to pick up on in, 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 your, in your notes. Yeah, I do, actually. I mean, I have a few more things to talk yeah, about, yeah, but sure. also on stuff that you've said. Let's work backwards. So you're talking about the, um, yeah, how difficult it is to write, and certainly, and talking as someone who doesn't write, yeah. the reason I don't is because of how difficult yeah. things like that are. You know, I very much love stories and do think I have a good 
sense of what works and what doesn't in a story. And that's why I don't write, because I'm never happy that anything I write works. But I feel like I do have good skills of pointing out what doesn't work in other people's yeah. um, and hopefully helping them improve that is sort of where I feel my skills lie. But exactly, I'm completely in awe that Pippin can write that story. It's just unbelievable. It did, this is kind of related to that, but me emphasising, I'm not saying in any ways that I could write this. It really reminded me a lot of basically my childhood of playing make-believe games you know, so a lot of the time with my sister, uh, a lot of the time with friends at school, and just all the time we were always playing games that involved making characters, making stories, and it was that kind of role play where the story develops as you go along really organically and kind of like improv, basically. I mean, I did a lot of drama, as did my sister with me when I was a kid and some of the friends that I played with. It, it definitely feeds from that sort of thing, that kind of someone introduces a new element to the story and you take it and you run with it and you build that world together and I loved doing that as a kid so so much um I remember being really sad going to high school when people would kind of spend their break times just chatting rather than playing make-believe games um because that's what I always did and what I absolutely loved and this story really took me back to that and this is in absolutely no way negative. I'm not saying it's like a kid wrote it or it feels like he just made it up as he went along and added new bits in or whatever. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just meaning it had that real feel of that sort of world building, immersive stories, creativeness that I I, I spent a lot of my childhood doing um and especially a lot of these topics reminded me of a particular friend of mine that we did this with a lot and I've actually recommended the podcast to her to listen to because it really screamed you know her kind of thing and that's possibly partly why it reminded me so much because some of the the story games that we'd come up with together feel a lot like this but yeah that's sort of connected to the writing I'm not in any way saying I could have written that kind of thing but the story that was written for it made me feel a lot like that really felt reminiscent of that and I thought that was a really wonderful thing um, so yeah, so the other things that you'd said before that about how it's written to build up in that uh, horror stuff, the, the creepy stuff like that, because it really does start off being really funny. You know, we talked about the kind of Rachel Paris kind of jokey stuff. There are a lot of jokes in it. Uh, sometimes they kind of start it off uh, just before the sort of credits part, I guess, is, is yeah. what you think if you think of it in sort of a American TV show kind of thing, the cold open kind of thing. There's some funny things like that. There's a couple I noted down that was kind of like, you know, if you stare into the void, well, it's going to stare back. Yeah. Um, it's going to think it's very stare. rude. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and there was one that was about, you know, the early bird gets the worm, but the early worm gets eaten kind of, kind of thing. You know, there's some really, really funny jokey bits in it. And I think I'd make the point that if you are feeling you're put off by the fact that it gets spooky and stuff later. Uh, I'm sort of, I'm saying this with my mum in mind. I know she listens and I know she doesn't like horror stuff. Um, So I guess I'm pitching it to her. But if you're thinking you're not going to enjoy that bit, then listen to the beginning bits. And if it gets to that point, you can stop. And I think that's way better than cheating yourself out of listening to any of it. Yeah. Because you're worried about that. Because, yeah, I think if you really like... The, the tone and stuff of the beginning of it, then it's worth listening to it for that, even if you don't stick with it. And maybe you'll decide, actually, I'm so invested in these characters that I do want to stick with it. So I think yeah. that's an important point to make on it as yeah. well. And I think the, the other thing um, about it is it's not like a gory horror story. Yeah. A lot of this, like, a lot of the stakes is basically about like Sam's mental and emotional well-being yeah. being rather than his physical well-being. And that's kind of like the major stake that's mm-hmm. kind of like um that goes runs 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 through the story. So yes, there's kind of like some physical jeopardy that some of the characters may face, but that's at the heart of mm-hmm. why we care what happens to Sam is we care about Sam because we want Sam yeah. to be okay, which oh, is definitely. kind of like the which is kind of like the the the, the key um mm-hmm. thing there. Yeah, it's very much you know psychological horror. You know, it does also have. The fact of there are some evil things that also have magic and therefore that's pretty scary. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the psychological horror stuff as well. And I think it's therefore important to note that it isn't just 
for the sake of it either and it's that kind of magical thing that uh fantasy horror sci-fi all those genres do as well as stories in general but specifically those genres which is showing us our lives with a filter over of something else that maybe we can use as escapism or maybe we can use to see those things in a new light um however you use it is totally valid but that there is some kind of reflection of real life issues in there um, I think a large thing is that there is a real metaphor, again, talked about in a bit of the bonus content between the house and what the house represents yes. um, and trauma being associated with place that is really interesting. There was also, getting a bit personal again, but there was, Sam talks about he can't get rid of this feeling that he just wants to go home even when he's at home. Um, and that is something I have certainly felt before. And I haven't actually, I don't believe, heard it or read it or seen that particular feeling expressed in fiction before or from anyone else before. Um, And so, yeah, without getting too deep, it really meant a lot to me, actually, that that very specific feeling of I want to go home, but I am home was in there. Yeah, that really touched with me. Yeah, I think that's... I mean, it's always lovely when you kind of hear about, hear someone, like this kind of like me and um, the Penguin story mm-hmm. that we re- yeah. re- reviewed. I wasn't expecting to get that hit of like emotion mm-hmm. from that story. So it's always nice to kind of like when you discover something that scratches a particular itch. Mm-hmm. So that yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really glad that you, you found that mm-hmm. in this story. Have you got any other kind of like notes you want to cover? Because there's one other criticism I want to make about the podcast. Uh, you can start with that if you want. Yeah, sure. So I think it was maybe three or four episodes too long. Right. I think they could have edited such you know a considerable out. Um, I just felt like it strung along a few strands that could have been condensed um, okay. a little bit more, and yeah, I think they could have cut some some fat out of the story. So it just it just makes me think. I know it's great to have like agency over your own storytelling, but it just it does make me think. You know if w- with a different editor or mm. producer in line, if they could have streamlined some of the elements a little bit more there. So that's kind of like, and I, I th- what, how did you feel about kind of like the pacing in general and stuff like that? Because that's kind of I think maybe where my criticism is coming from. I felt it could have moved along a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, no, yeah. that definitely makes sense. I think I felt the pacing was all right. I think I do get what you mean though. And sort of towards the end, maybe more of it is... Sam is learning loads of stuff, you know, he's finding out what's happened, he's putting the pieces together. And uh, maybe in some cases there's a lot of us hearing him make those realizations that is maybe partly what drags out some of those bits near the end of season one. Yeah. And yeah, I think you make a good point that no matter how amazing a writer is, a fresh pair of eyes from an outside perspective that's thinking, okay, how is someone not in your head? going to receive this is yeah. always a really valuable thing for sure yeah. yeah um so yeah i can definitely see how you mean on that but yeah actually overall on pacing i was quite pleased with it i think yeah yeah, yeah. i think it's just towards the end i felt mm-hmm. that okay come on Let, let's get going let's go yeah that's fair come on. yeah yeah but i guess in defense of that I was really loving it. As I've said, I really blasted through it. And I know we are on the reviewing season one, but I couldn't help myself listening to more. Um, And so in that sense, I can certainly be happy that there was more rather than less (laughs) for more to listen to. Yeah, so that's um, definitely a fair point. Um, You had a couple of more notes you wanted to discuss, I think. Yeah, I did. So, um, well, firstly, I mean, you'd said to mention about the cats. Yes. Um, So, yeah, there's uh, cats in it. The named cats are Revel, Eggroll, and Cosmo. We good also names. have a cat good called Cosmo. Yeah. They <laughs> are good, strong names. We have a cat called Cosmo. Uh, we named Cosmo because uh, I was reading a Gwyneth Reese book called Cosmo and the Magic Sneeze with a black cat with a white tip on his tail. And then we got Cosmo, who is a black cat with a white tip on his tail. So we named him Cosmo. So yes, that was really cute. Um, and yeah, I really like that. You've got these cats provide a real emotional support for Sam. Um, you also have a lot of stray cats that are unnamed as well that are in there. So they're really cool. And also some elements of moving the story along 
um, in some ways the kind of, you know, you've got that kind of cat intuition kind of thing and the way that the cats kind of mew at Sam and stuff like that, it makes what is in some senses a very monologue thing, it helps to break those moments up into a bit of dialogue. Yeah. You know, talking with someone, not just to someone. Um, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, I think the Sam, uh, Sam's cats do play a fairly major role in the story at points. Kind of like you mm. know, kind of especially in terms of like there, there, there's a point where we're not too sure if like Sam is turning into a crazy cat person. <laughs> yeah, and but no, like the, the but, you know the cats do kind of also uh, move along some of the supernatural. Um, elements as well so it's kind of a useful thing to kind of have in there as another kind of like layer to kind of consider in the story yeah definitely and what was the last thing that you wanted to oh we say mention? last but i'm gonna look through back yeah, 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 yeah. um one thing about this that you might have got this impression with us talking but i feel like it is i'm trying to think of the right term for this but a very much a fandomy type thing yes it really lends itself to fandom and i think there's a lot of you know reasons behind that there's a lot in this you know audio drama that is really about community you know the the segment that it's you know replicating is called the advice and community segment there are forums that are part of the huge part of the plot you know a lot of those letters calling in are actually like forum posts and also of course the lgbtq plus representation and the idea of community behind that i think is a really big lender to it and like i said about weird gods it's that kind of feel as it it feels quite tumblery and not saying that in a bad way at all but yeah it is very much that i feel like it's that kind of community but having said that if you don't feel that's you you don't in any way feel excluded from it you know like it you can write a load of fanfic for it you can join the discord server and be really prominent in that you can you know cosplay you you can go really fandom on it and um, come up with theories you know while you're listening along what do you think's happening what's that and you can go go really hard in on it but you can also not you yes. know it, it, i think it's a really good thing where it definitely has that feel to it, it definitely lends itself to that but you don't feel like you have to participate in all those things in order to be a fan of it. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, actually, because there are kind of like, especially with um, you know, things like Star Wars and like Lord of the mm. Rings and kind of like all these sort of things, like kind of that you've got the gatekeeping fans where, yeah. you know, if you don't know this, if you're not on the forums, you haven't got the T-shirt. And I think yeah. this is the sort of story that you can just, yeah, you can go on like, you know meet other people and uh on the forums and discuss it and stuff we can just enjoy it for what it is which i think yeah. is also really nice as well yeah yeah no definitely definitely another little thing was another little comparison thing so one of the funny jokey bits about it but in some ways actually gets quite serious is that as part of the advice and community segment there are augury forecasts and some of these are quite funny in their specificity. So sort of, you know, if you're walking down the street on a Tuesday, make sure to take your raincoat kind of yeah. thing in, in, in an absurdly specific way. And if you're talking to a person named Charles, then this, you know, that kind of thing that I think can be quite funny. And so it's sort of a recommending both ways, basically. If you listen to one of these, you might enjoy the other. There is a podcast that I really love called Erin is the Funny One. And it's made by YouTuber Jax Films and his wife, Erin. And it is really, really funny. I, I love it so much. They do like fun quizzes and also just chatting. And they're just really both really funny people. But one of the things that they do is they have a horoscopes segment where they both make up really ridiculously specific horoscopes um, and read those out. And it's super funny. And you kind of have two sides because Jack doesn't, believe in anything horoscope related whatsoever erin sort of does have an interest in it certainly but they both take the piss out of it equally and in really funny ways and they then started doing a bit where they did it like i think it's mad libs where they would write it but with gaps and then ask the other person to put in you know give me an adjective give me this you know and it made the story really funny and basically they each read each other's out so they make each other say stupid stuff yeah um and 
it's so wonderful hearing them both break at each other's jokes especially because you know one makes comedy for a living on youtube yeah and the other doesn't and yet erin is the funny one you know yeah. uh it's it's really fantastic so yeah that was kind of a big tangent but the sort of if you enjoy those little bits in spirit box radio with the potentially could be kind of farcically funny specific augury forecasts then check out erin is the funny one it, it is really good yeah. equally if you like that section then that's just another reason to give this a go yeah um, it's yeah, really cool. I, I think we could probably talk about this for mm-hmm. at least another like 30, 40 minutes. Or so I think we should probably uh, wrap up. I really enjoyed this. I think it's mm-hmm. a great, really superb audio drama. I mean, it's won two awards already. Mm-hmm. And yeah, kind of really well done, Pippin. Yeah, sometimes you meet people on these things and they kind of like expose you to stuff that you end up really enjoying so yeah thank you thank you to Pippin for being on that course with Mm. me and yeah this is this is really good so if you're into your your supernatural stuff or if you're interested if you're interested in kind of like audio dramas that kind of like are a little bit meta and play around with like different ideas around different storytelling methods and being referential um to the yeah so it's I I really enjoyed it so yeah Mm -hmm. Oh, completely agree. Loved it. Yeah, thank you to you for recommending it um, and passing the thanks back along the chain for introducing you to it. It's fantastic. It's really good. I hope people give it a go. I listened to it yeah, in, in really quick succession. I was really enjoying it. I listened to this over other stuff that I was listening to, you know, yeah. other audiobooks I've got on the go. This was what I was wanting to listen to. Um, I guess we haven't really spoken that it's also in like, there's a bit of variation, but it's sort of, 15 to 20 minutes yes that's what i was about to standard. say yeah. yeah yeah i mean with the exception of a couple of the later ones which are a yeah. little bit longer than that most of them mm-hmm. are between 15 and 20 minutes so it's p- perfect for uh it's not perfect for a tube journey because i try to listen to this on the mm. tube and like you really need to pay attention to the episode so kind of if there's any like uh ambient sound i think this is definitely one of those ones where you do kind of like maybe need to take 15, 20 minutes at lunch to kind of uh, listen listen to an episode rather than a noisy train carriage or something mm. like that because you will miss out on some of the subtleties and it's quite that the sound design can be kind of quite dense and you do need to be paying uh, attention to a few things as well, mm. yeah. I also find it really interesting that you say that because I, in some ways, had it a separate way. I mean, i totally with you about the sounds, yeah. I think, yeah. you know, and especially if you don't have the sort of headphones that are going to block your external noise out, then yeah, it would be a shame to miss on those sounds. But in some ways, I felt, and maybe this is partly why, not the main reason, the main reason I was just loving it and really invested, but maybe partly why I was picking it over some stuff, because although, yes, like you say, you do want to listen to the details, there are definite like clues in there that you don't necessarily want to miss. I personally felt like I didn't have to give a thousand percent attention on this oh, one. Oh, I was I'm, the opposite. I'm, yeah, oh, yeah, so yeah, this yeah. is weird, especially <laughs> because this is both of us going a bit against our, yeah. our natural grain, yeah. really. But I sort of listened to some of this while I was, uh, you know, playing some video games and stuff like that. And I, I don't know if maybe it's partly because, you know, I may have just been a bit restless, you know, and I've yeah. wanted something to occupy my hands and my eyes while I've been listening. Um, I listen to some at work, which, you know, I work in audio. We have been told yeah. we're allowed to listen yeah. while we work. It's encouraged. Yeah. But sometimes I can't, sometimes there's like books that I don't want to listen to while I'm focusing on work because I want to, you know, hear every word. And equally, sometimes I turn anything off because it's just a bit distracting. But I felt like this one, I was sort of happy to have it, not in the background, but with other stuff going on. Because it felt easier to listen to. Um, And I also think that's maybe one of the differences with the kind of different content that we talk about between the air quotes written word being read or performed to you versus something where it's being spoken to you, which obviously with this mimicking radio is what this is. And genuinely, you picked out the same word that I did, but in a different way. Because of that, it isn't as dense. Yeah. You know, it's not like if you're listening to a really long audio book where basically all the sentences are fully packed and they lead from one to the next to the next because it is very much more loose. You're being spoken to, you know, and I, I felt, yeah, that meant that I could be more relaxed in my listening to it without oh, worrying see, that I was I missing was something. Complete, I'm at the completely opposite end of the spectrum there. I, okay, was, yeah. like, I was quite tense um, through mm. some of it and I was thinking, 
all right, uh, what does that sound mean? And um, mm. the inflection in the voices and, oh, am I missing something out there? And, oh, why is that kind of like the train rattling and that bit? I'm going to have to re- go back and rewind and yeah. see if I missed something. So, yeah, so it's interesting how we... Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's quite no, interesting. It, it yeah. really is. <laughs> and it's maybe partly because I guess that's sounding more like you're doing that sort of investigative you know, where are all the clues I want to find them all kind yes, of thing. Yes, I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, whereas I think, I think I definitely can do that in some stuff. But for this, maybe just, you know, circumstance of how yeah. I'm listening to it at the moment, yeah. or maybe it's something about how it is written or whatever and how that affects me, yeah. I was happy to be taken along for the journey, you know? Okay. I really love that there are a lot of stuff that, yeah, you can pick up and you can go, oh, maybe that's going to be interesting later. Or you can go, Sam, what the hell, why are you missing that? That's yeah. so obvious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I wasn't overly desperate about, checking off every thing and i think it'd be really interesting so because pippin even recommends again bonus content of like you know go back and re-listen and there'll be stuff that you missed because it was plotted out for the future and i think i'm really looking forward to doing that and going oh i missed that but in that sort of oh i didn't pick it up the first time way and it being really clever rather than having to pick it out the first time you know and like we've spoken before about the replayability of a lot of books um haven't we i think yeah and you know a lot of the time i want to dedicate myself to the book i'm listening to because i know there are so many books out there i'm just not going to listen to it again yeah you know so if i relax and miss a bit i've missed it forever so i better pay attention the first time round because in all likelihood i'm not going to sit for another 20 hours and listen to it again there's too much other stuff out there (laughs) yeah whereas i think this I would be happy to go back to again, partly, yeah, because of that pull of, oh, what did I miss that I didn't see the first time? Because it's really cleverly intertwined. And also just, it was really enjoyable to have on. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I think that's a, f- a fair point. I think we're reaching the same conclusion, but from some, kind of slightly different yeah. approaches. Um, yeah. Anyway, that was my summary. Um- <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you to Pippin for um, mm-hmm. uh, bringing this into our lives. Um, that's mm-hmm. a bit strong. Um, <laughs> guys, please support the podcast by subscribing and leaving a review wherever you find it. You can leave a tip in the tip jar, which is in the episode description. And yeah, if you want to send us a, a, an email with recommendations or any comments, it's audiobookishpod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening and in exciting news, please tune in to the next episode because we'll actually be talking to the uh, writer and creator of Spirit Box Radio, Pippin Era Major. That's a really exciting guest to have on for us. Yeah, definitely. Any final words, Poppy? Uh, No, I think I've said plenty, but yes, definitely recommend. And yeah, thank you so much. Okay, cool. Uh, We'll leave a link to Spirit Box Radio in the episode description so you can go and check it out. Okay, thanks, guys. See you. Bye. Bye.